Week one in the sermon series on Samuel, from a flicker to a flame. You know how it goes. An accident happens and several people are there to witness it. And investigators question them all and receive vastly different reports. What's more, if you go back and ask them six months or a year later, the recollections of these same people will likely only add more variation to the story. Truth can seem like it's in the eyes of the beholder. We see a version of this situation when we turn to the Bible and the story of the Israelites moving into the promised land of Canaan. You can read the Joshua version, and the process sounds like total conquest, swift, decisive, and cohesive. Joshua is Moses' hand-picked leader, and he leads invasions that are successful with only so much as a trumpet call to make walls tumble down. To my way of reading, anyway, it seems poetic, and idealized. Well, that's not how the book of Judges tells the story at all. This version of the same era reads entirely differently. The Israelites don't come off like a singular force, and the movement seems anything but swift and decisive. It's more like a disorganized infiltration with scrappy tribal leaders named Judges, filled with God's Spirit for a time before messing up and doing evil and being knocked out of the ring. Tribes that don't always play well together, and by the end of the book, engage in internal warfare and commit horrific atrocities against each other, and are not living as God intended. By the end of the book, the writer's summary assessment of Israel is that all the people did what was right in their own eyes. Anarchy, faithlessness, hopelessness. That's where we are when we begin the book of Samuel, at the nadir of Israel's identity and community life. So it's really no wonder that the story of Samuel would begin with barrenness, emptiness, despair. With a woman like a holy remnant who is faithful and God-fearing, who cannot conceive a child, who is provoked by her rival, the other wife of her husband, Elkanah, Whose husband and he is oblivious. So where does humble, faithful Hannah turn? Why she presents herself to the Lord in the temple at Shiloh. We didn't read this part, but Eli the priest is there when Hannah prays amidst the tears of distress, vowing to dedicate her son to the Lord if only he would open her womb. And to give you an idea of the state of the priesthood and its piety quotient, why Eli figures that Hannah must be drunk. Baffled by the suggestion, Hannah reiterates her cry, and Eli assures her that God has heard. O Lord, if you give your servant a male child, I will set him before you, she says. Even as Israel, the priesthood, and her own womb seem hopeless, Hannah is reassured. God had spoken through Eli, and she believes. And guess what? She has a son. She names him Samuel, and she dedicates him to the Lord. And so the story of Samuel begins with a barren mother who hopes against hope, who believes that her wide-eyed young son can play a part in God's story, and that God has never given up, never thrown in the towel, never said, I'm done. Samuel grows up. Hannah and her husband continue to care for him, bringing him clothing and gifts each year, as he is raised in the temple. In the intervening chapter 2, we learn that the sorry state of the priesthood extends to Eli's sons. They play fast and loose with the offering plate and fast and loose with the females. Such atrocities simply had to be stopped and a new day needed to dawn. Well, that new day came, and like all days, it started in the dark, by night, literally and figuratively. As chapter 3 begins, we are reminded that the Word of God was rare in those days. Eyesight had gone dim for Eli. Small wonder, given what the priests were up to. So Eli was lying down in his room, having lost his capacity to see with his eyes and to know God with the eyes of his heart. And yet we read, the lamp of God had not yet gone out. God had not left the building or left the Israelites. God had a plan, and it involved 
Samuel. So Samuel's in bed as well. The motifs in the Bible are in full display. God comes in a dream, as God so often does in Scripture, comes to an unlikely character like Samuel, and comes three times. The Bible likes threes. Samuel, Samuel, God says. Samuel jumps out of bed thinking that Eli is calling, but alas, he is not. And he sends Samuel back to bed. A second time it happens. God is still awakening Samuel to his purpose. So a second time he goes to Eli's room. Eli sends him back and he responds once more. Three times is a charm for even Eli to figure out that God is in the mix. So this time when Samuel comes by, Eli tells him to go back, listen, and respond again if it happens because it's the Lord trying to speak to him. So this time... When God calls, Samuel says, speak, for your servant is listening. It is only when Samuel listens that God's will can be discerned, and Samuel learns that times are going to be bad before they can be good. Some things need to end so that other things can begin. For starters, the corrupt priesthood needs to go. Getting the agent of God right with God was a first step. The house of Eli would be punished, and a new voice would ring out through Samuel. A fresh start would find its source in him as he grew in knowledge and insight. The text says none of his words fell to the ground. When Samuel spoke, people listened. From north to south, from Dan to Beersheba, Samuel became known as a prophet of God, for he was faithful and trustworthy returning regularly to the Lord at Shiloh and opening himself to what God would have him say and do. And so the first installment of Samuel ends as the young man is growing in his sense of call and trusting his future to the Lord and speaking up with words of guidance and wisdom. Next week, we'll learn how his life and ministry unfold. So learning about Samuel, it's important For just like we get to know each other through sharing stories, we get to know the Bible by sharing its stories. And that's reason enough to recall and remember Samuel. That word, remember, its roots are Latin, meaning to be mindful of, again. In other words, to remember is to give a story shape and meaning again. And it seems to me that such remembering also re-imbues a story with significance, gives it meaning not just for ancient times, but also for us. So as we go through the story of Samuel in these weeks, it comes alive when we ask what it has to do with us, to remember it with contemporary meaning as well. And I see connecting points all over. After all, the saga began with the lament that everyone did right with what was in their own eyes, that there were situations of anarchy and hopelessness. Wait a second. When was this book written again? In light of mass shootings in different parts of the world, turmoil in Europe, challenges in everything from our educational system to our aging infrastructure, discord in the public square, the alarming decline in church attendance, why it feels eerily contemporary, why our story is there in the book of Judges. In our world and in our individual lives, there are times when it feels as though the word of the Lord is rare and visions are not widespread. Like Eli, our eyesight grows dim. We struggle over the choices we face, our concerns for financial security, worries over our safety, brokenness in our relationships, struggles with our jobs, our fears for our children. A cloud of despair can take over as our vision shuts down. Well, even as the story of Samuel begins, there is an important lesson. There can and should be a different response. For out of a barren Hannah, came surprising new life. Out of eyesight gone dim and visions that are rare came the call of the Lord to Samuel. In the darkness and silence of the night came the voice of God calling out God's servant's name. It happened in Samuel 
and it can happen with you and me. Dim as the flicker may be, we can hold on to the fact that the light of God has not gone out. Today's excerpt reminds us to respond like Samuel with the words, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Let us trust that God is active among us and doing a new thing with us and through us. If only we listen and respond, the flicker of hope can become a flame. We cannot simply figure someone else needs to do something. God is calling each of us. We must be faithful like Samuel and respond, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Here we are, Lord. Send us. Amen.